Creatine, once a supplement reserved only for meathead gym bros, is now starting to creep its way into the endurance sports world, particularly cycling. For a long time, the rhetoric around creatine was simple. It may help you with your sprint a little bit, but, you know, you're also going to gain a little bit of weight, and hearing that is like hearing nails on a chalkboard for most cyclists. Gain weight? Yeah, I'll just avoid that one like the plague. But some are starting to reconsider whether to write creatine off so soon and even go as far as to say that the performance benefits from taking it will outweigh, pun intended, the weight gain that you will inevitably experience. So if you watch this channel regularly, then you already know where I'm going with this. That's right, I tried creatine for 30 days and this is what happened to my body. That is a real before and after picture and totally not AI generated. I'm just kidding, of course. Today, we are digging into what the science has to say about creatine, and hopefully by the end of the video, you should get a better idea of whether or not you should be taking it to get faster on the bike. Welcome back to the channel. This video is fueled by the feed. First things first, let's get an understanding of why creatine may help with athletic performance at all. ATP, which stores energy, stands for adenosine triphosphate, and when it releases energy, it loses a phosphate group and becomes ADP, or adenosine diphosphate. Creatine is converted into phosphocreatine in the body in combination with phosphate. Maybe you see where I'm going with this. Bro. If you think anybody is following along with this nerd talk, you're delusional. Phosphocreatine can now act as a high energy buffer and shuttle. It donates phosphate to the ADP and regenerates it into ATP during times of high energy demand, but it is used up extremely quickly. We're talking about in 10 to 15 seconds. Essentially, you can think of creatine as increasing your energy reserves when you are getting close to tapping out the amount of short-term energy available to you, like when you're lifting heavy in the gym or doing a sprint. The key term there is short-term. This is not an energy reserve that will help you get back home if you're bonking five hours into a ride. Now, your body makes its own creatine and you get a little bit of it in your diet, so by no means do you have to supplement with it. But it's not enough to fully saturate creatine stores, which is where the theory behind supplementation comes in. If you have fully saturated creatine stores, then perhaps you would have more energy available to you. And when it comes to short explosive efforts and strength, this is undoubtedly the case. The literature is pretty clear on this, and at this point, no one is really arguing whether or not creatine can improve strength. None of what I said so far is controversial, but the question still remains, and the reason you probably clicked on this video, Will creatine help with endurance sports performance as well? This study on oral creatine supplementation and cycling performance put subjects through an incremental cycling test to exhaustion before and after supplementing with creatine. Promisingly, lactate concentrations were reduced, but when it came to actual performance metrics like time to exhaustion and power output, Although results were better after creatine supplementation, they weren't quite statistically significant. I picked out this study because it's one of a few that seem to show some physiological benefits to taking creatine, but when it comes to actual performance, the results are usually incredibly small or just non-existent. And while this study may seem promising, the fact that it lacked a control group could have accounted for most of, if not all, of the improvement. The placebo effect from taking a new supplement is often more powerful than the supplement itself. These somewhat unspectacular results continue in studies like this one on creatine ingestion and performance in a simulated road race, where subjects performed a two-hour cycling test with three 10-second sprints every 15 minutes. Unfortunately, in this one, some subjects were given a placebo, making for a control group to make for a more reliable comparison. Keep in mind that if creatine were to improve cycling performance, it would probably be in repeated 10-second sprints like this study sets up, as opposed to, say, a 20-minute time trial. Looking at some of the physiological markers, things look positive with a decrease in muscle oxygen consumption and increased plasma volume in the creatine group. But again, when it comes to actual performance, the creatine group didn't perform better than the placebo in the time to exhaustion and in the final sprint, nor was their sprint power any higher. 
One thing that did change was body weight, which was on average two kilograms or four and a half pounds higher after supplementation. This doesn't seem incredibly promising for creatine, and it's studies like this one that have led coaches and athletes to abandon the idea of using creatine for endurance sports. That being said, the literature is not all bad. We do also have studies with positive results like this one that showed that creatine increased interval power by 18%, or this one that showed an eight to 9% improvement in repeated maximal sprints. And this creates a much muddier picture. So it's at this point that we need to take a step back and take a look at the balance of evidence on creatine. You could always find a single study that confirms your particular bias about creatine, whether that it's a miracle supplement that will finally help you get to a 400 watt FTP, or that it's nothing more than weight gain powder and I might as well just stop skipping dessert instead. And don't act like you haven't played these games with yourself when you're trying to get down to race weight. Yes, I'm talking to you. Anyway, what we want to know is what direction the majority of the studies point on creatine. This 2023 meta-analysis on the topic did just that, compiling 13 high-quality studies with placebo groups and done on well-trained athletes. What they found? Creatine appeared to have no effect on endurance sports performance. At the end of the day, the evidence that creatine improves performance for long duration efforts simply isn't there. If you have a friend that's claiming that creatine improved their FTP, for example, then it's more likely that they're either succumbing to the placebo effect or that the improvement was due to something else that they're doing, not the creatine. You're right. And that's because everybody knows that it was actually... Hypergain Beast Mode Mass Gainer Raw Edition in the cupcake flavor. That being said, while endurance performance is obviously needed to be a good bike racer, the difference between actually winning and losing often comes down to efforts that would be classified as anything other than steady state. We're talking about a final sprint or repeated surges throughout the race. This 2023 article has this idea in its name, surges and sprints to win the race and it explores this concept a bit deeper. As you can probably guess, this article takes a different stance on creatine by taking a look at the efforts that are actually required to win races. When you look at the evidence in terms of its impact on different training zones, things start to get a lot more interesting. In this graphic, zone two lies between the two lactate turn points, just like it does in the three zone model, but they add an extra fourth zone on the end, which is above VO2 max, so essentially we are talking about sprinting. What you may notice is that as intensity increases, the amount of evidence for creatine's efficacy increases as well, with little or no evidence for zone one and two, but increasing evidence in zone three and strong evidence in zone four. It should be expected that creatine has no effect when the test is essentially a steady state effort, but if the test actually mimics the demands of a race, the results may flip. This review also comes to a similar conclusion. On the other hand, someone who races crits or cyclocross or mountain bikes may see a benefit to creatine because these events often require repeated high power efforts in the 10 to 30 second range. Even road and gravel races will often require surges and the ability to sprint at the end of the race. I do realize that this weight gain is a big sticking point for most cyclists. Some of you probably turned off the video as soon as those words came out of my mouth. But if you're still watching, if it's any consolation, this weight gain is not from fat. It's from water that has accumulated in the muscles. That being said, physics doesn't care if that weight is muscle or water. If you're two kilograms heavier going up a hill and not putting out any more power, you will go slower. So I don't want to make it seem like everyone should take creatine all the time. There may be certain athletes that even if they take it in the off season, they stop taking it during racing for this very reason. But there are other benefits to taking creatine beyond just improving your sprint that may tip the scales in favor of taking it. First, creatine may help with recovery. This review on the topic finds that creatine has both anti-inflammatory and anti-catabolic properties that may not only be useful for athletes, but also those in disease states like cancer as well. On top of this, creatine has also been shown to mitigate muscle glycogen and protein degradation, particularly in endurance athletes, 
which will further aid in an athlete's recovery. Creatine also appears to be beneficial for the brain. This includes findings like improved memory on creatine, especially in older subjects, as well as improved cognitive function with increases in processing speed and attention time. If I'm being honest, creatine is much more than just a supplement for gym bros. It's a cognitive and overall health supplement as well. Now this isn't a health channel, so I won't get too up on my high horse about health right now, even though I have been known to do that but this could manifest as improved performance on the bike as well in the form of faster recovery and potentially improved decision making during stressful situations in a bike race. Now, to my knowledge, the latter has never actually been tested, but it's not a crazy inference to make given the data that we have. It's also worth noting that vegetarians and vegans may experience an even bigger benefit from creatine given that they consume less of it in their diet and have been shown to have lower creatine stores. Creatine may also have a bigger effect on those who naturally have a higher proportion of fast twitch muscle fibers. Interestingly, females naturally have higher intramuscular creatine stores so it's speculated that supplementation may be less effective for them. At the end of the day, the reasons to take creatine are numerous, including improved performance during repeated short duration punchy efforts, improved recovery, and cognitive benefits. The trade-off is a bit of weight gain in the form of water weight, probably one to two kilos or two to four pounds, and for some people, it may cause GI distress, but that's usually only in high doses during a loading phase, which I don't recommend. Just as a side note, creatine has been shown to be safe to consume regularly over long periods of time, so you don't need to worry about that. Given this, I think that every cyclist, actually scratch that, every person should experiment with taking creatine. However, certain athletes may want to come off of it in preparation for certain types of events where power to weight ratio is everything and the effort is relatively steady. But even for these individuals, taking creatine in the off season or even when there's just not a race right around the corner will probably be beneficial for the recovery benefits alone. So you've decided that you want to give creatine a try hopefully, or maybe you just zoned out during my ramblings for the last five minutes, which is also totally plausible. Uh, in my notes, I have 400 watt FTP and no need to skip dessert. I feel like I got the gist. So what is the best way for cyclists to take it? Well, you should keep in mind that creatine is a supplement that needs to be loaded, meaning that it needs to be taken every day over a period of time so that you can build up your stores of creatine to get the benefits. This is not a supplement like caffeine where you take it before a workout and then you get an acute benefit. In fact, when you take it in the day is probably not super important. That being said, taking it around a workout may help with uptake as well as taking it with carbs, and taking it with carbs also helps with glycogen resynthesis. To be honest though, I would just take it at a time of day that's easy for you to remember, like every morning with your breakfast or when you take your other supplements. Creatine is a supplement that can come in different forms, but the most well-researched form with the most efficacy is creatine monohydrate, and this is generally what is recommended to athletes. It's generally found in a flavorless powder that you can mix in water or a smoothie or a shake. Some people recommend doing 20 grams of creatine a day in the first week as a loading phase, but this can cause GI distress in some people, and you'll get to full saturation after a couple weeks anyway if you just do five grams a day, which is what I recommend. Doing just five grams a day as opposed to loading it in the first week with 20 grams a day may also minimize the potential weight gain. If you're a smaller human, you may wanna take a little bit less, and if you're a bigger human, you may wanna take a little bit more. But honestly, five grams a day is good for the vast majority of people, and there's really no need to overcomplicate things with different doses and loading phases. This is a supplement that if you're gonna take it, you should be taking it every day, so starting off with the maintenance amount of five grams a day is fine. If you take five grams a day, the weight gain from creatine along with the benefits will probably take about a month to accrue. And if you stop taking it, you can expect to lose that water weight and said benefits in probably about the same amount of time as well, if not a bit quicker. As far as what brands to go with, this is not in any way a sponsored video. I did not get any money from Big Creatine. Believe me, this video is not a paid ad. <laughs>
GCN would be disappointed in you. As long as you're getting creatine monohydrate, be sure that you are, the brand is probably not super important. I would just go with a brand that has a good reputation for not selling contaminated products. That being said, this video is fueled by the feed, so if you want to help support the channel, why not grab your creatine at the feed? They've got a bunch of different brands to choose from. Link down in the description below. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like, subscribe, and share it with your cycling friends. I'll see you in the next one.